facts of life in this uh, in this session. Uh, universities represented here, comrades from the human rights space, young people, students, uh, representatives, uh, feel welcome. Uh, Honorable Minister, my simple role this morning is basically to welcome you and uh, all delegates uh, to this ninth edition of the Digital Rights Forum taking place in Malawi. Uh, before I do so, Honorable Minister, allow me that uh, I uh, say a few words as a, a way of welcoming you and the delegates to this uh, important um, event. In the first place, uh, Honorable Minister, this event, uh, you may wish to know that uh, it has taken place in 17 countries on the African continent. And Malawi is one of those uh, 17 countries. By uh, symbolizing probably the significance of this dialogue in this country and also indeed also signifying uh, the interest that this country has when it comes to digital rights. I know when uh, Paradigm Initiative was looking around in, in terms of identifying the countries out of the 55 that we have, and the, definitely there were reasons why Malawi was picked as one of the 17 countries. They definitely, there is a positive reason why Malawi you know, was a, a choice out of the 55 countries on the continent. And we didn't want as a as youth and society and indeed Paladam Initiative, uh, applaud your ministry, uh, honorable minister and the government of Malawi for making strides in ensuring that uh, we make progress as far as digital rights and inclusion are concerned in this country. We are aware of um, the digital economy strategy that was launched in 2021, and that uh, it is quite an ambitious uh, strategy that if really implemented to the later, we should be able to see significant progress in this country as far as digital rights and inclusion is concerned. For example, the digital economy strategy talks about increasing access to internet from the current 14.6% to around 80% by 2026. That's quite an ambitious uh, you know, commitment from government. And we are proud government for you know, taking such an, ambition, uh, such an ambitious uh, step. Uh, as you are aware, Honorable Minister, if you're talking about 14.6% of our country being connected to internet today, Basically, we are excluding around 76% of our population. And that is unacceptable, particularly when we are talking about, you know, internet as the fundamental right. Through internet, all of us are accessing services. Without, without internet, obviously, you know, you can't have other services issues of access to information immediately are undermined if we don't have access to internet. Therefore, we are really proud and we would want to applaud the government for taking such uh, you know, significant steps. We are more, are more so mindful of another commitment that government would want to review the taxes uh, around the uh, digital services. Uh, there is a uh, there's an indication of uh, reviewing the uh, you know the excess taxes and uh, mobile services and, and so forth. Would want to encourage the government to do more on on, on taxation because those those taxes that uh, begin you know to uh, increase costs of services, among other areas that the digital economy strategy you know is advancing, and we are really excited to associate with that government agenda to ensure that we digitize our economy. And probably these are some of the reasons even ourselves and, and, and Paradigm Initiative uh, you know, thought this uh, drift uh, would be important for our dialogue 
uh, in this country. Honorable Minister, as the Director of Ceremonies already indicated, that this ninth edition of uh, the Digital Rights Forum uh, comes at a time when we need as a country to reflect on the gains, the opportunities, and the gaps that we have as far as the digital rights and inclusion are concerned. Drief, the main purpose is to create a platform <clears throat> for much stakeholder dialogue. If, if we just look at the introductions that we, we have, uh, we just had here, it demonstrates that diversity and would want really to enhance that dialogue among various actors when it comes to digital rights and the digital inclusion. We want the robust engagement of the universities, government, civil society, student union movements, various government institutions as well, that they are part and parcel of this dialogue. At the end of the day, honorable minister, and distinguished delegates would want to address the bottlenecks that really undermine digital rights and the inclusion. We realize that no single stakeholder can address the different challenges that uh, we face. Some challenges are related to the legal landscape, others are related to law enforcement, other related to access, the demand supply as well, citizens are exercising their fundamental rights. By coming together, we trust that we are going to address most of the challenges facing our digital rights landscape. Therefore, our role is basically to be a facilitator and create a platform for constructive dialogue on digital rights and inclusion. Honorable Minister, this drift in 2022, you know, comes at a time when we are also at really, you know, nascent stage of the implementation of the Access to Information Act in this country, which was operationalized uh, in 2020. And we would also want to interrogate how we are doing as a country in terms of implementation of the ATI Act. Bearing in mind that access to information is a fundamental right and indeed an enabling right for the realization of other fundamental rights. While we acknowledge the strides that have been made and I know the platform uh, today is to delve into all the key issues Allow me also to highlight that uh, this drift uh, 2022 comes at a time when there are growing concerns around digital rights in this country. Issues of inclusion are serious issues. As we speak today, around 4.1 million Malawians in this country have no connectivity to the, just to have the network. Because if you look at the statistics now, we only have about 71% of the country that is connected, that have access to connectivity. How do we account for the exclusion of 4.1 million Malawians who don't even have an access to a telephone network? These are serious issues that we really need to interrogate. How do we deal with the serious violations taking place online? that uh, women face day in, day out in this country. How are we addressing those, those serious issues? There are issues, Honorable Minister, of state interference with the freedom of expression online. Just for the last 18 months, we have recorded not less than 15 arrests in this country and two convictions for individuals you know, who express themselves online and the state moved on them. Some of them were arrested, uh, kept for some days, released without charges. Some of them were charged. Two were convicted. 
and one person, honorable minister, as you might recall, who was convicted is a is a a man who, in his own right, and uh, for the love of his friends, probably had uh, alerted his colleagues on social media platform Facebook that one of the banks, uh, one of uh, the employees of one of the banks, uh, you know, were duping customers. So for him, that was an alert to a, the public or his colleagues in that, on that platform that people needed to be very careful. They, made, they needed to be monitoring their bank accounts because there were, there were these um, you know, alleged schemes or, or clandestine activities. This is a gentleman uh, that earned himself uh, a conviction. Uh, like enough, he was uh, given an option of paying a fine. I also have in mind a 20 year old woman who was arrested last year for simply sharing a WhatsApp message, forwarding a WhatsApp message that we alleged that uh, a suspect, a rape suspect in police custody was released on bail in questionable circumstances. This lady was tracked by the police, was arrested. And uh, there are so many cases, Honorable Minister, that uh, really uh, raise questions around uh, state surveillance of private conversations of individuals, interception of private individuals, uh, conversation of private uh, uh, individuals. And these are really raising uh, concerns when it comes to freedom of expression online. And we are encouraged, Honorable Minister, that uh, when the president had a breakfast a session with the, the media a, a two days ago, uh, he had a really um, assured um, all Malawians that uh, the Tonsa administration uh, will not allow you know, this crackdown on freedom of expression, both offline and online. Uh, and we trust that uh, those assurances, Honorable Minister, will be really taken seriously, particularly by the law enforcement uh, institutions that at times get uh, you know, overexcited uh, with, the, with the law enforcement. We are also mindful of the fact that um, we have draconian laws that really need to be repealed or reviewed that have been used for undermining fundamental freedoms and rights. And it is our core honorable minister that it is high time that uh, those uh, and outdated archaic laws, some of them dating back to colonial times are really reviewed to ensure that um, they are, our laws are in tandem with the 1994 uh, you know, constitution. Uh, if we keep those laws, uh, that really do not leave to the taste of the constitution, one would argue that uh, perhaps we have not really moved much uh, in terms of uh, actualizing our, uh, our, our democratic constitution. Therefore, we are encouraged to learn from the president and your leadership that uh, there is commitment and willingness to review some of those archaic laws that really undermine freedom of expression, undermine uh, access to information. Honorable Minister, as I did indicate, my, my role is basically to, to welcome you to end. Therefore, let me, on behalf of youth and society and uh, initiative, the conveners of this platform uh, this morning and indeed afternoon, indeed also highlight that um, there are so many stakeholders around here that have committed to the advancement of digital rights and inclusion. We'd like to acknowledge uh, several institutions that have even mounted the pavilions uh, just uh, uh, in this room here. We have MACRA, we have a consortium of Oxfam, DCT and YAS, we have MHAB, uh, we have a sole paradigm initiative. We have Malawi Human Rights Commission that demonstrates the commitment and the willingness 
uh, to really advance digital rights and inclusion in this country. We really would want to appreciate and thank you uh, Pat, for demonstrating this commitment. And let me invite a round of applause for these partners for uh, demonstrating this commitment. Honorable Minister, let me also thank where we held the Digitalks, another engagement a platform on digital rights and inclusion. So we really want to appreciate a Paradigm Initiative for the leadership, but again, for identifying Malawi as one of the countries for collaboration and partnership. We don't take this partnership for granted. Finally, let me thank our distinguished panelists that are going to lead this discussion uh, this morning and afternoon for really accepting to provide the leadership in the discussions we're going to have uh, this morning and afternoon. We don't take your time and your investment for granted. Once again, uh, Honorable Minister, uh, let me welcome you and uh, really feel welcome and let me also thank you for finding time. Uh, I amidst you know, tight stages that you have, we really appreciate your leadership I know already you, 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 you are planning uh, driving up north, uh, probably for the, for the you know, uh, press freedom events. And so you are a very busy person and we don't take your you know, presence for, for granted this morning. It is therefore at this point, my singular little privilege to invite you honorable minister uh, to address us uh, this morning. Thank you so much. I think they, they need to start making these podiums a little, a little higher now. <laughs> yes, some, some people are tall and some ministers do at all. Um, go, good, mo good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the Director General for the Malawi Communications Regulatory Authority, MACRA, Mr. Daud Suleiman, I understand you'll be joining us uh, in a moment. The Honorable Ombudsman, uh, Madam uh, Grace Malera, the Executive Director for Youth and Society, Mr. Charles Kajulaweka, officials from Paradigm Initiative, uh, who are also the co hosts of uh, this forum. President of the ICT Association of Malawi, Mr. Bram Fuzulani. I haven't seen him, but I'm sure he'll be joining us. Well, this is a very important for forum. Representatives of uh, the academic institutions, members of the diplomatic community, have some, heads of local and international civil, civil, uh, civil, civil society organizations, distinguished invited guests, members of the press, ladies and gentlemen. to freedom of expression, information, and the 
communication, privacy, that's number three, and data protection, and four, protection of minors from cyber threats and bullying. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, the guiding thematic message today is towards a digitally inclusive and rights respecting Africa. Carries a keyword digital inclusion, which is very important to consider when designing CT projects and programs in this country. As we gain strides in the ICT sector, there is a need to ensure that there is equal access so that those that are marginalized, including the youth and women, are not left behind. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, access to ICT services and products is a human right. It is against this background that the United Nations devised the term broadband internet as a human right. Access is therefore no longer simply an option, but an area that needs strategies to ensure that demographic and socioeconomic factors are not a stumbling block towards the enjoyment of the critical right of being online. This is the reason that my office continuously worked tirelessly to ensure that internet services and the cost of connectivity are affordable in the country. As we are all aware, the internet is uh, the base of ease of communication now. And my ministry has also embarked on projects such as the public free Wi-Fi because digital rights demand the need to address eco and access to the ICT products and services. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, digital rights demand need to ensure that there is freedom of expression, freedom of information, and freedom of communication. You may recall that during commemoration of the World Press Freedom Day, His Excellency, the State President of the Republic of Malawi, servant is held accountable by the people of this country at all times. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, as the use and adoption of ICT increases, vulnerable groups need to be sensitized on the emerging cyber threats. These include the youth, women, minors, and regular users of the internet. My ministry will therefore work with responsible ministries to ensure the systematic implementation of the online child protection strategy. My ministry will also oversee the finalization of the Data Protection Act to guide the manner in which confidential and sensitive data can be protected, managed, and shared. The Digital Skills Ecosystem and Gap Assessment Report for Malawi in the citizenry is able to use basic, intermediate, and advanced ICT uh, skills, they will enjoy digital rights and inclusion. The usage of ICT services and participation in ICT activities demands foundational skills. And I want to assure you that once again, that my ministry will embark on mass ICT literacy programs that will see that even school dropouts are being exposed to basic ICT uh, tools and, the, and skills or to ensure that no one is left behind. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to highlight one government's intervention that is aimed at ensuring 
universal digital rights to every Malawian. As you are already aware, governments through the National Planning Commission has, has formulated the digital economy strategy that seeks to transform the way business operate, how citizens interact, and the way government delivers services. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me encourage you to take an interest in this strategy and ensure that you, uh, you put uh, a lot of interest into it so that uh, as much as possible, uh, we are moving and moving towards a good direction. This is our strategy, a strategy for each and every Malawian and not a strategy for those working in government, it's for everyone. Um, let me also uh, debut a little bit on my prepared speech, because sometimes we, we meant to speak like robots uh, when they prepare these uh, speeches. So it doesn't sometimes, uh, not that speeches are bad, but I think uh, there's an amount of also appreciation that we have. I think uh, what, what, what we're trying to communicate is that uh, government is very much committed in ensuring that uh, we're moving forward. Uh, this is why uh, we have put up uh, an effort to make sure that uh, uh, the cost of data, for example, is reduced, but that's not it. What we want to do as government is not to set in forces elsewhere to make data affordable. We're doing whatever we can do to make sure that we are in control of data prices. We're in control of the investment that we're doing. Um, that we can only allow 14% people to of our people to to access internet. We have less than 380,000 smartphones. That's a hugely embarrassing by all standards. 300, in fact, there are 20 million now in Malawi, we believe, to have 380,000 and then we want to think that we are making progress. I think it's not fair. I think that's uh, that's that's uh, belittling the element of fairness. Uh, so we're doing all we can to make sure that one, we have higher penetration. Uh, higher penetration means better uh, capacity, better connectivity, and the uh, better network. And the government is doing all it can. And my ministry also is leading in ensuring that uh, whatever we are resource is being used very well. It's not a question of rushing to the World Bank, get loans and then abuse them. And then uh, there's this uh, <coughs> uh, culture of saying, no, we want to spend this money so that we qualify for the next bunch of World Bank loans. I think that has killed many African countries because the people, especially those that are entrusted with the responsibility to apply for these loans sometimes, uh, although be interested to get a loan, but a loan is a loan. Right now, as I speak, this country has a lot of loans. Uh, so whatever loan, especially in the uh, uh, area of um, digitalization, ICT and general uh, issues of that matter, I think we are um, putting a lot of attention to make sure that every quacha, every dollar is being used and used very well. We are doing that because we understand that uh, future is digital and Malawi was not there during the first industrial revolution. Malawi was absent during the second uh, 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 industrial revolution. It made no appearance during the third and we cannot afford during this fourth one. 
to be absent. Because if we do, then we should actually forget that we have a country. Uh, government is very serious about these things because we also don't want to face a situation like what we are facing now. You know, people are having to pull us by the nose as a government. Those who are, uh, for example, once upon a time, this, 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 this country had a, a state controlled uh, company that was making uh, or manufacturing cooking oil. And we never had problems where people are just raising the price of cooking oil as we didn't need it. Uh, there was wisdom once upon a time that people had to establish SFRFM and ADMAC to make sure that they procure and distribute and sell fertilizers, good quality fertilizers. Look at what is happening now. That uh, we frustrated the market. Some will hear that instead of selling fertilizer, they're, they're selling dongo and soil and sand and all that. There are so many things that we need to put in place. Um, I can mention so many other things. Uh, I hope that uh, this will not go into other important uh, sectors. Um, uh, we need to make sure that we are, are taking control of our quality. Now, uh, it will be very, very unf unfortunate for us as government not to take very much big interest in the matters <laughs> digital. Because all these things that we have mentioned, whether it's the agriculture, Will be digitalized that's e-agriculture e-health e-commerce e-banking uh e-infrastructure everything will be e and we cannot afford that government must be distant from that e uh revolution because then i think uh as time goes by uh if we depend very much on the uh the private sector that much um i can assure you that it would be worse than cooking oil, it would be worse than uh, fertilizers, it would be worse than uh, any other thing that you can uh, think of. So we are seriously looking into this to make sure that we protect the interests of our people. We are making sure that uh, 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 we, 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 we continue to invest and invest very well. So very shortly, we should be making certain capital announcements in terms of how we want to move forward and whatever we are doing, we're following that strategy. We cannot talk of uh, a digital uh, strategy that is being uh, driven by government and then we have no, no control or no active participation on, on these, these issues. Then I think there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect. So we Some of the corruption issues, some of the theft issues that you hear in government have been happening because we are a paper economy. We are a paper economy. Now I want to migrate from being paper economy or paper administration to paperless. So we must go digital. Now we can't, we can't say we want to fight corruption by digitizing uh, and then that digital authority is in the hands other than that of government. I think he, um, we, we think that there's also a disconnect there. So there's so much that we're doing. Uh, private sector will have a role to play, but the government will not be uh, left behind or should not be standing, will not be standing aside and the, uh, let certain things happen in the manner uh, that probably may not uh, marry uh, our vision. Uh, let me also mention as I'm moving towards con conclusion, that uh, we will also be dependent on the uh, institutions like uh, yours, uh, uh, Mr. Kajuraweka and other institutions to create awareness, uh, you know, among our people. Awareness that will tell them of their responsibilities, awareness that will tell them of uh, what is expected of them when they're online, 
uh, I think it, will, it, it is something that we ha also have to be careful, both government and the uh, civil society and other stakeholders. Uh, but it's not necessarily that when one is on the, online, then automatically he becomes above or he, he, he's above the law. I don't think that's what it's supposed to be. Uh, it is not on for government to be arresting people arbitrarily, um, but at the same time, we are also calling for the, uh, on the citizens to be very, very responsible when using the net. Uh, there's Gobakacha has killed people. There's Gobakacha has made people lose their lives. The, the, this Gobakacha has made people lose their jobs, lose their marriages. People have lost their credibility. People they have lost their integrity because someone uh, goes on net and disguises himself as a, a person A and then publishes lies. I think we also need to be, uh, to all of us, to make sure we create awareness so that people are using the net uh, very, very, um, uh, responsibly and uh, productively. Uh, you might wish to know that the first five We are creating awareness uh, so that uh, there is responsible use. People should not be afraid to open uh, uh, the internet. Say, I don't know. You're literally afraid. And people are, wherever they go, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I No, I think he slowly. Let us start to uh, create awareness uh, so that people enjoy uh, the usage of uh, internet and, the, and, and so on and so forth. And then you also mentioned the issue to do with taxes. We are looking at it from both sides because the main reason why taxes are mentioned, uh, the, the reason is uh, um, the, the price. Yeah, if, if we work on the price that's affordable, well, I think the tax issue should not be an issue. But if, it's, if it is a tax that is making uh, 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 accessibility or affordability difficult, uh, then I think that uh, will be looked. But at the moment, I do not think that tax is a main, main issue. But it doesn't mean we have taken off our eyes from taxes because we still believe it's something that we can look at and the negotiate uh, within government strata and see how we can, how we can do these things. Um, again, I mentioned about the laws. Uh, there's need for more awareness uh, government-wide, but also public-wide, that everybody must know that, okay, I can't do this. This is breaking the law. Because if I just wake up one day and start to write uh, lies about Mr. Gajiroeka or uh, Madam uh, Maria, I'm breaking the law. You know, I'm breaking the law. It doesn't matter whether I'm doing it online or I'm doing it at home or I have met him and, uh, or her and I'm telling them, uh, you know, um, uh, physically, that's breaking the law. So I think we need to be creating more awareness as opposed to, um, to maybe send a picture that he, as long as you're online, then you can do whatever you want in injuring other people who are innocent. I think... He, I'm sure 90% of the people here, including those at the high tech, must have been a victim in one way or, or the other of someone who published a lie. And sometimes it's very shocking. How, how did they get this? Wow, 
so we shouldn't take internet to be a sad uh, thing. Uh, it should be something that should bring a lot of development, a lot of progress, and a lot of smiles. I think he, that's how we expect these things to happen. So uh, in conclusion, I must say that uh, our government is very serious and very, very serious on these matters. That's why now you saw my ministry used to be called Minister of Information, and that's it. But now it's Minister of Information and Digitalization, which means now uh, it's very visible because that's one of the uh, president's uh, priorities and the, uh, uh, what he wants to achieve in uh, ushering in or in achieving the dreams of Malawians. Let me also take this opportunity to thank Yas and the, our, our colleagues from um, and our colleague from Nigeria, and of course, uh, University of Malawi, Zuz University, members of the media, some are coming from Malawi Human Rights, um, and then some are from young politicians, uh, some from uh, so many institutions. I think the complexion and of the representation is very encouraging because the, uh, it means uh, there's a lot of interest from civil society, the academic, and, and, and so on and so forth. But let me also take this opportunity uh, to thank the Honorable Ombudsman for... Uh, why do you call it Ombudsman? I think you would need to change. You'd be Ombudsperson or something. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, and uh, thank you so much, Madam, for making it here. And Mr. Akajuroeka, we really appreciate that uh, as you are doing this. He thought that government must also have its presence. And that's the sort of spirit that we want so that uh, we should be working together. We might not agree all the time, but that does not necessarily mean that uh, we, we, we are enemies. No. Uh, if we want to develop this country, we need to start embracing uh, views that we don't agree with. It's, it's normal. Uh, yeah, similarly, you might not agree with us as government all the time, uh, but look at it from a very uh, normal, productive point of view. Uh, but we should not also major in disagreeing. At least we should have uh, a certain percentage of disagree disagreement. That's healthy because then it means you will move it. But largely, let us make sure that whatever we do, we're doing in agreement so that we're able to serve the people that we all represent. Once again, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for the opportunity uh, to stand before you and that you can listen. May God bless Malawi and may God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, our guest of honor, the Minister of uh, Information and Digitalization, uh, Honorable Gospel Kazako, for the assurance that uh, government will continue to safeguard the fundamental princ principles of uh, uh, press freedom. I'm a bit worried because the, our guest of honor has responded to some of the questions that I had planned to ask him during the panel discussion. So I'll have to come up with another set of questions for him uh, during the panel discussion. Otherwise, he deserves another round of applause uh, for the keynote address. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Stefano. We continue with our program this morning. I would now like to invite Mr. Jimmy Kainja. He is the senior lecturer in media, communication, and cultural studies at the University of Malawi, and is going to give us a public lecture on the state of digital rights in Malawi, gains, opportunities, and challenges. A big hand for Mr. Kainja as he comes in front for the public lecture. Thank you very much, our guest of honor.
uh, this function towards digital inclusive and rights respecting Malawi. Um, much of what I'm going to discuss here has already been said by the minister, as well as by Mr. Kajoroweka, which says to me that uh, perhaps the discussion is more or less like just a reminder uh, to most of us over what these digital rights are. Um, it looks like a new area, especially in Malawi, maybe five, four or five years ago, there was not much discussion about digital rights. Um, some argue that digital rights are just human rights. Why separate? So this is what I'm going to uh, discuss. The outline is as follows. We are going to look at uh, what is digital rights. So trying to understand or unpack the term digital rights. Then you're going to look at the state of digital rights in Malawi. And you can see there, I've indicated three things, access and affordability, privacy and data protection, as well as severance. Maybe the first two um, is what the minister uh, mentioned as well. I've added severance there. And then um, as a way of uh, concluding, we'll look at uh, a way forward or maybe uh, my own recommendations over what we can uh, do perhaps. I'm doing this uh, fully aware that uh, we have panel discussions uh, thereafter. So pardon me, <clears throat> if some of the information uh, will seem repetitive uh, from what uh, others have said already. So understanding digital rights. The simplest definition or understanding is that uh, digital rights are human rights on the internet. Others say digital rights are human rights in the internet edge. That's a very simplistic way of understanding it is correct. But there are also other ways of understanding this. The two following points. One, digital rights are the right to express yourself in a space, private, secure, and sustainable space. Two, digital rights are human rights online, which allow access to information and freedom of expression in a safe space that respects privacy and security. So you can see here that um, the two follow-up points from the initial definition of what digital rights is, is a bit more broader. It takes into account of things that people have to do online. Um, our constitution in the Bill of Rights, which is chapter four, um, guarantee all those uh, freedoms, freedom of expression, freedom of assembly. So today within, within digital rights, we also talk about digital, I mean, uh, freedom of assembly. People have freedom of to assemble anywhere they want. The same is also replicated online. People have the right to assemble in whatever forums they want to join. Not to be forced, um, but by free will. So all these things are uh, included in what uh, we call um, digital rights. Others have a much more broader definition, including uh, people with different disabilities, women and so on. All these things actually matter. In other words, um, digital rights is looking, at, is looking at environment, online environment that is inclusive, secure, and safe for everybody to use. And also uh, an environment that is um, affordable. Um, these understandings are emerging from um, different sectors of society, for example, the uh, 32nd session of the Human Rights Council, that was in 2016, uh, affirmed that the same rights that people enjoy offline must also be protected online. The only difference perhaps, this is why we converge and discuss these things is that offline to enjoy your rights and freedoms, you don't really need a lot of things, but online, Actually, there are equipments, knowledge, and things that we need. You need to have a gadget. 
you need to live in an area where there's uh, network coverage. Electricity, we take electricity for granted. You can't run these gadgets without electricity. That's why most of us are seated where you have extensions. You need to have that gadget working. If you don't have electricity, it doesn't work. Uh, Malawi um, has less than 11% of its population connected to electricity. That electricity is very sporadic, as we know these days. And when electricity goes off, still working, um, how does that work? It's probably because uh, transmitters have been run on diesel fuel and all that. And that all that uh, part and parcel of expenses that we pay. So, um, freedoms online and offline differ.
actually they live in areas where there's no network coverage. So the two uh, goes hand in hand, but they are not exactly the same. So the Malawi Communication Regulator Authority, MACRA, is mandated to ensure that so far, in so far as practical possible, every, Mal every Malawian citizen must have access to sufficient, reliable, affordable, and affordable communication services. And that's uh, in Communications Act of 1998, uh, part two, section four, subsection one. Uh, the minister alluded to this about universal, um, having universal access to uh, telecommunications is true. Uh, that uh, MACRA is mandated to do that. I'm glad that uh, I've seen um, uh, MACRA here and uh, uh, over maybe the last two years or so, I've noticed that MACRA is engaging actually a lot on issues to do with the internet. For a very long time in this country, MACRA was seen more or less like it's just there for broadcasting. And I think if you walk out there, ask every average Malawian, what do MACRA do? They'll tell you broadcasting. But MACRA has much more broader responsibility. So I'm glad that MACRA is getting involved into this. And this is my personal take on it. Um, so studies um, have shown that uh, although MACRA has this mandate, it has so far fallen short of fulfilling this mandate, especially in terms of access to communication services, the internet in particular. Internet uh, connectivity is very low. Others have mentioned the same already. Um, according to a study, I think, uh, and again, I'll say I'm happy because I've seen a booklet there of uh, of this study, which came out in 2020, I think, but was published in 2019, according to the book. Um, according to this study, Mark Rajit, in conjunction with NSO, um, only 14.6% of Malawians have access uh, to the internet. 40.7% of these are in urban areas. So if you're talking about inclusive, you begin to look at the smallest number of people that have access to the internet in Malawi, uh, also in urban areas where minority of Malawians live. Most of our people live in rural areas. So the situation is skewed in that sense. 98% of Malawians ask um, internet through mobile phones. So uh, why I've added that is because mobile phone is very, very important in terms of um, connecting people. And as others have said, less than 75% uh, of our country have uh, actually are living in areas where there's uh, network connectivity. Now, um, you see that also I've added there that a significant number of Malawians, according to this study, for the 6%, um, said that they don't use the internet because they don't know what the internet is. Um, have a lot, long, long way to go. And you see there, only 2.4% uh, are those of us that were making noise that I must fall and whatnot. Those of us who think internet is very expensive. Um, I do not want to look at 2% as an insignificant number. It's very significant, at least because there are people who are demanding services there. But that for 6%, or the people who do not know what the internet is, then we have a serious problem. Uh, Honorable Minister say you want to embark on um, um, media literacy. I think uh, this is a big, big job. Maybe in the future I need to work in conjunction with um, Minister of Education. If it was up to me, I would introduce um, media literacy at the youngest level so people understand how these things work, people understand the importance of it, not just knowing how to use the gadgets, but they need to understand um, ins and outs of the whole thing. So maybe uh, because you are discussing, maybe that will come up at uh, some point because this is um, shocking indeed. So it is recognized internationally that uh, people must have access to secure, stable, reliable, and trust with the internet, secure, stable, reliable, and trust with the internet. Um, if I were to ask here, I don't want, but if I were to ask here, by the show of hands, uh, most of us can agree with me that uh, it's very rare that we finish a five minutes, six minutes phone call without 
a line being cut. Our services are very sporadic and problematic. Network is a problem. And if you look at those points that I'm making and try to do an assessment in Malawi, I don't think it would pass the end of that. But that's what is needed. A study in 2019 by GSMA um, found that 72% of Malawians, uh, only 72% of Malawians had uh, network coverage. And that's what Mr. Kajoroeka pointed out um, uh, earlier on. So I'll not dwell much on that. But again, according to Freedom House report, Freedom on the Net of 2021, um, it says that those that have network coverage in Malawi often experience slow, sluggish, and reliable connectivity. So the 14.6% uh, that we're mentioning is there in figure. But if you are trying to look at it in terms of uh, qualitative vary, the problems are there because 14.6% can even deceive us. Um, much of what that 14.6% uh, means are people who can only have certain uh, aspects of uh, the internet. So for example, somebody can only afford a WhatsApp bundle for one week. Somebody can only afford um, Facebook bundle maybe for a day or two. Um, so the number is problematic and uh, increasingly um, we are being encouraged also to be, uh, to start discussing about quality of access and not just access uh, uh, to these uh, digital facilities. Um, one of the things that, for example, in Malawi affected us a lot during COVID-19, uh, we failed to teach online, not because uh, the internet is not there. The internet is there, but it's not really reliable. And in most cases, the internet that we have cannot take heavy data. Those that have been in Zoom meetings uh, for maybe international conferences, you agree with me that it's mostly Africans who join the Zoom meetings without their videos on to try to save a bundle. Yeah? So we don't basically put these screens on, not because uh, we don't want, but our internet cannot allow. And these are questions of quality as well. So access, qualitative value has to go with the question of quality um, uh, to that. I've, uh, I don't know if it's very clear on the, uh, on the screen. And the study that I'm, uh, I'm, I'm referring to is that that's, that's a screenshot. So that's uh, a mobile connectivity index uh, uh, from GSMIM. If you go and find that report, uh, it makes a very, very good reading if you compare Malawi and the countries that have surrounded us. Because we say Malawi is a landlocked country, that's why internet is very expensive and whatnot. But so is Zambia and so is Botswana. You can go and see um, the differences. Um, the network coverage, uh, you have infrastructure on, in yellow, uh, the levels of affordability in, I think, pink. Then blue, you have um, consumer readiness, and then you have uh, content and services and it breaks down within those uh, four. Um, I'm sure there will be another report if this. It comes, I think, annually, but this is 20, um, 2019. So I put that up there basically uh, for perspective. You can also look at this. Um, that map shows you uh, a 20-year period of internet in Africa from selected countries. So you see that uh, by the year 2000, every country in Africa had less than 1% internet penetration. By the year 2019, people had moved on. Look at where Malawi is and compare other countries surrounding. We are only better off than Burundi. And I don't know, I'm not very sure population of Burundi, I should have checked earlier. So it's a question of a decision. You make a decision whether to get it or not. Others made a decision, others did not. And that's why we find ourselves where we are. Because for a long time we've treated it as um, um, platforms as a luxury, uh, for example. Uh, the, the question of taxation. I remember in 2015, when the 10% on text messages had been introduced, uh, then um, the Minister of uh, Information then said, oh, going to talk to Minister of Finance, blah, blah, blah. Um, nothing really happened. But that 10%, though, it was a bit contentious when 
it came in 2015. But it has said now it's normal that uh, that tax is there. It's not as if you are taxing something that is um, something that is uh, um, uh, what um, a luxury. No, um, and you can see again from that um, from that map that there are several countries that are actually. Um, landlocked countries that have done better. So again, I put that as a question of perspective. This study was done by um, uh, Gandan um, organization called SPESA. So this was in 2019, they were looking at a 20 year period um, from 2000 to 2019. Then away from issues of access and um, affordability, we look at issues of privacy and data protection. The question of privacy is um, a bit more tricky because what I've learned over the years is that some of these terms uh, are very difficult to conceptualize when we think uh, when we think about it locally. You know, people have this aspect that uh, why too much emphasis on privacy as if I have anything to hide. That's not what it means. Um, so to start with, the um, constitution of Malawi um, guarantees um, the right to privacy, and that is in section 21. Um, it's, it's very interesting that um, in its uh, provision, it also includes um, um, interference with private communication, including mail and all forms of telecommunication, the last aspect of it, C. So subsection C. Um, but when you look at uh, this provision in the constitution, you find out that uh, it's not actually uh, enough because in particular in the digital age, uh, what we need is to have um, digital, uh, rather data protection um, uh, that is specifically for digital environment. There's a draft, uh, uh, bill, which I think it was drafted in 2020, but uh, I haven't seen it, it was on um, um, uh, uh, on the website, I think e-government website for some time now, it's been withdrawn, but there were consultations, so I hope that uh, bill comes out um, um, uh, very soon for discussion and eventually we have a law on this. Why I'm emphasizing uh, this is because um, the right to privacy online is very important because it also intersects with many other uh, human rights, such as freedom of expression, um, which allows people to seek, receive, and impart information, but also freedoms of association and assembly. The importance of this is that um, when people know that their data can be um, secure, that nobody will interfere with their information, people are actually going to be more open to discuss issues. People are, are going to be more freer to discuss issues online without any fear. Um, but when you don't have this, um, people are always um, suspicious. Um, for instance, you will see, um, if I go back here, you will see that, um, all right, maybe as a matter of example, all of us here, may not have anything to hide. But we know that none of us can take our shower outside. You always need to have that space when you are on your own. And in most cases, you find that people, uh, they are having their bath, their shower, yeah? people will sing, people will do what, because that is a bit more liberating environment where nobody can actually see you. you know, knowing that somebody is watching you is always problematic. We have a say that vina vina sa vinika because you know everybody's eyes is on you. But if nobody is watching you, you can act, actually act better. So our best creativity is when we think nobody is spying on you, one way or the other. So um, Malawi lacks this data protection law, although there is uh, a bill that I mentioned, 2021. But in absence of the data protection, the right to privacy cannot really uh, be guaranteed. For example, what would happen to somebody if is snooping on me? Somebody has uh, my data and actually abuse that data. What is going to happen? And in Malawi, um, in the last five years, maybe from 2017 
uh, there's been mass data collection programs, I'll call it that, especially with the implementation of the national ID. Today, national ID in Malawi is required for literally everything that you have to do. So what that means basically is that our information is being centralized through that uh, national ID. We have mandatory SIM card registration. Uh, if you want to get your passport, if you want to register your phone number, which is also uh, mandatory in Malawi, and any other things that you have to do, including private uh, transactions such as banking, all these actually you need um, uh, this card. Now, um, you will see, I had this discussion with um, some vendors in Zomba because I wanted to register my card, um, uh, my SIM card, but I didn't realize actually that my national ID had expired. It expired a year or two, I think, after getting it. Again, looks problematic. So I said to this guy, I said, but do you know that actually if you go on Macra website and see the policy, it will tell you that there is no law that says everybody has to use national ID to register their uh, for numbers in Malawi, unless the laws change. That law is not there, but we are actually being forced to use national ID. Citizens become suspicious. There is no law in Malawi yet uh, that says to register for voting, you really have to use national ID. It's not there yet, but we are being uh, forced. So when it comes to that, uh, citizens become suspicious. And that's what I'm trying to point out there, that um, this massive uh, data collection um, that we have, uh, that we have, you know, people are surrendering their data uh, willingly, it needs to have a law that protects it somehow. So in absence of that uh, data protection, uh, actually, we have the problem of surveillance, um, uh, lack of data protection online, collection of uh, people's information actually paves way uh, for surveillance, state surveillance, I must say. And evidence in Malawi of surveillance is actually emerging, in particular, weaponization of the law. Uh, Mr. Kajoloeka mentioned the number of people that have been enlisted in Malawi uh, between uh, 2021 and today. I must commend that, uh, again, for the first time, uh, we are seeing institutions that are interested in documenting uh, these things. I recall that um, for a long time, I don't know if it's still there, MISA used to have um, a publication called So This Is Democracy. It was a title. They would document all the abuses of uh, media freedoms within that year. So maybe perhaps if you have the, something similar to do with the digital rights, people then can be able to see within a 12 year period and say, this is actually what is happening. So for instance, we've seen a recent arrest of a um, journalist Gondwe, and in his own account, you can go on his Facebook, you will see actually that uh, of surveillance who he had been speaking to within that period. However, um, in most cases, we don't tend to look at these things in that sense. And it's not just journalists. There are several uh, Malawians that have been arrested over that period, including uh, those that have been accused of inciting the president, inciting an MP, um, talking about uh, the banks, as uh, Mr. Kajoloeka said. But when you look at all these things, actually they have um, one thing in common. Those that have been arrested are those that have been uh, arranged to have inserted powerful people in society. So it's not as if the laws are, are there, or if the laws are not there, why is it that only those that are being accused of inserting powerful people in society organizations are the ones that are being taken to task? If um, you look at that environment, what happens basically is that we are giving a picture uh, that there are untouchables in society. People can be free to discuss issues over any other person, individuals, but not specific groups in society. Inevitably, these arrests bring what is called a cheating effect on citizens because um, citizens are scared to participate in online conversations. And especially for a country like Malawi, where we are coming from, really from the bottom in terms of access to the internet. If we um, 
put in front this picture that if you say things online, um, things are go people are going to be arrested and whatnot. Although indeed in some cases, um, and I think this is a debate that we need to have, um, freedom of expression versus cultural and religious norms, because you have arguments about, oh, I think I will now we start. That's culture. And culture and laws sometimes don't always work together, uh, one way or the other. But uh, the point is that um, if the picture that is emerging out there increasingly is that of arrest online, it brings this chilling effect on citizens. Citizens become uh, scared to go online. And that is not good for a country where we want to encourage people to, uh, to be online. So from a journalism point of view, we'd also see that this induces self-censorship in which um, it is also an affront to um, some of the fundamental um, human rights, including freedom of uh, expression. In uh, 2014, a journalist by the name Glenn Greenwald um, said this, that only when uh, only in the Liam where we are not being watched, we can we can really test the limits of who we are or who we want to be. It is really in the private realm where dissent, activity, and personal exploration of life takes place. When we think we are being watched, we make behavior choices that we believe other people want us to make. It's natural, rather, it's natural human desire to avoid societal condemnation. That's why every state loves surveillance. It breeds a conformist population. I think that's what, that's not what we want to be. You, you want to let people be as creative as they can. You want to let people be as open as they can because only when people are open, uh, only when people are um, allowed to experiment can people contribute meaningfully to the development um, of their country and their communities. So what is to be done? Um, when you look at Malawi's 2026 20, digital economy outcomes, you realize that there's so much emphasis about um, the internet. Um, you just look at the core part, the one at the top. It says by um, 2026, uh, network access should be increased to 80%, brilliant. Uh, we have four and a half years to go. And the broadband access to 95% of the population. We increase the device ownership. The minister talked about how many people are using smartphones. So the aim is to increase that to, um, from the current, it says 51% there to 80%. And also uh, skills uh, in secondary schools and so on. Why I'm putting this here up basically, it's not really to deal with the numbers, but it's to show that um, the encouraging thing is that the government is aware of most of these things and there are that strategy uh, in place. What we also know is that, uh, and this has been circulating in so many followers for many years, that uh, Malawians, we are very good at drafting and putting things on paper, but very bad at implementation. And uh, in most cases, if you look at uh, uh, entirely the report where I'm getting this, um, the implementation, the how part always come, you know, comes up, that uh, how are we going to do this? I was listening to the keynote uh, from the minister and um, I still asking that question, how are we going to get to this? And um, in my own thinking, I've put four points there. I think the first thing to do we need to invest in infrastructure in order, in order to enhance access to the internet. Infrastructure in rural areas, infrastructure in urban areas, because where we don't have infrastructure, we need one. Where we have infrastructure, we need infrastructure that is resilient. Two, we need to make internet affordable with respect to net neutrality principles. Um, Recently, we've seen some changes in um, mobile data. Uh, there's Pantheon, there's more fire, you know, which is more affordable. Um, although, interestingly, I've been looking around for 
maybe our colleagues at Markla uh, can help us. I'll ask maybe privately later. I've been looking for any policy document that has enabled these data changes. Surely there should be something in writing because we need to get to the point where we differentiate, are these just promotions or is this really permanent? Something has to be there actually to say, this is a policy that we're being followed. We are followed, we're following this policy on ABCD because otherwise mobile companies uh, will have uh, uh, a director today, that director may be, not, may be there tomorrow. They'll make a different decision. Likewise, at macro, um, uh, positions can change. Different people make different um, uh, positions as well. So I've been looking, trying to find out what informed these reductions. I think we need to get that right as well. And another thing I've mentioned there with um, respect to net neutrality. The point about net neutrality is this, that um, people in a country should have equal, equal access to the internet, not because I've paid uh, uh, 10,000 a quarter and therefore I can only get access to, uh, to, to uh, uh, what, to two uh, megabytes per second, for example. Somebody pays 50,000, gets eight megabytes per, uh, per second. What, you, uh, what you're doing basically there, you are also victimizing those that have less money. They can access the internet with lesser speed than those who have more money who can access internet with more speed. So as these policies are being made, as data bundles are being reduced, we need also to respect the net neutrality principles that regardless of how much somebody earns, they should have equal access to an internet in terms of speed and in terms of quality. Internet should not be tiered uh, based on income. That is also creating other levels of inequality. That's what I mean. So uh, the, uh, this is mentioned already that uh, government also need to enact uh, data protection laws so that people uh, should be free and safe when they are online. And uh, finally, and this is, MISA has been you know, drumming up this drama for a long time. We need to repeal all draconian and, dem and democratic laws because what we've done now, we have a Communications Act, for example, uh, cybersecurity and um, online transactions, all these laws that have, have come up uh, tend to basically to be um, contradicted by some um, uh, uh, colonial laws, in fact, we have section six of the penal code. Somebody gets arrested uh, for their activity on the internet today for a law that was made in 1960 before Tamunda left. That is not, uh, that is not correct. So in other words, um, this is what I wanted to say, but it says um, opportunities. Much of what I've said seems very negative, but that is, that's a picture that we have in Malawi. But I want to say, that what is encouraging is that we are now having discussion about these issues. And we're having really important people attending. Uh, the ministers here, the director general of MACRA is here. Um, uh, we have um, committee members of parliament present. So I think we should take this as an opportunity, all of us that we should work together. When some of us, when some people stand up and say, oh, can we change this? It's not because um, we don't, we were trying to uh, spite somebody or not. No, but we all are citizens of this country. And if you can work together, things are going to work uh, properly. And I would also urge that, as you have seen the presentations that I've made, that digital rights and the internet is actually something that is smart stakeholder. If you ask me about how my computer, how internet technically work, I'll not tell you. I might tell you something about policy. So you need people in ICT, you need people who do policy, you need people who do uh, education, you need people who are in civil society, and you are actually need people who do legal stuff. So if you put people together, actually are going to come uh, to, to, uh, to get a better outcome. Um, I said the earlier on, uh, I think we should move over this issue where um, the argument is something has happened. Somebody has been arrested. Oh, uh, we accuse the government because you are arresting people. Oh, but people should have um, behaved better one way or the other. I think we need to get over that period and start having a discussion over what we can do to make sure that people are actually online. Yeah, that's a prerequisite. I'll stop there. Thank you.
Mr. Ganja was asking me whether he should go and resume his seat. Uh, maybe there is a question from the audience, or maybe we can open up during the panel discussion. Um, thank you very much. That's uh, Mr. Jimmy Kainja, Senior Lecturer in Media, Communication and Cultural Studies at the University of Malawi. Thank you very much for uh, a thought-provoking lecture on uh, digital rights in Malawi, which focused on gains, opportunities, and um, uh, challenges. I know there might be some comments, but I think we'll definitely have to open it up during the panel discussion that is coming immediately after the tea break. Our guest of honor, uh, this marks the end of the first part of our meeting this morning. Uh, we'll have a tea break for 30 minutes. Um, the first thing we would humbly request you to inspect the pavilions at the back there. We have got um, uh, a digital rights expo at the back there. We would humbly request you to uh, inspect the, the displays there. And uh, immediately after that, we'll have a group photo and then we can proceed for tea. Thank you very much, our guest of honor.